Hello and welcome to the contributor talk number 78 of the FNANO conference 2020 titled Enzyme Powered Transport and Diffusion Phenomena. I'm Jan Philipp Günther from the University of Stuttgart and the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems. Today I would like to talk about two broader topics. One is the motion of active particles through solution, called diffusiphoresis, and the other one is the influence that active particles have on materials in solution, like convective transport phenomena. In both cases, I will focus on enzymes, and I will show that on the left side, um, single enzymes may not at all be possible to exhibit enhanced diffusion when they are active. And on the right side, I will show you some applications and devices that we manufactured with immobilized enzymes. Here's a little outline of my talk. First, I will talk about the two applications, enzyme phage colloids in micro pumps and enzyme phage flow through catalytic converters. Um, then I will talk about the single enzyme diffusion experiments that we did with fluorescence collation spectroscopy at first and then with PFG NMR. As for the applications, we are using a biohybrid approach. Why are we using this? Well, in a biohybrid approach, you're combining inorganic materials like, for example, nanoparticles or microparticles with biomolecules in this case enzymes, to get by hybrid materials. This approach has several advantages since you can combine the best of both worlds. From the inorganic material side, you get the realization of complex shapes and patterns and interesting properties that are hard to achieve with biomolecules, for example, magnetic or optical properties. From the biomolecules, especially enzymes, you get very high substrate selectivity and you can use substrates like glucose instead of hydrogen peroxide, which are non-toxic, which might be very interesting for medical applications, for example. First, I would like to present our idea of an enzyme phage colloid. It's something that combines a carrier particle in the middle with uh, bacteriophages. Those are very long viruses, as you can see here. They have a very high aspect ratio. And uh, we bind to the phages uh, enzymes. Compared to a conventional approach, this uh, largely increases the surface area that's available for modification and therefore increases the enzyme load. There are also other advantages. For example, that enzymes feel uh, very well on uh, proteinaceous surfaces like uh, bacteriophages and therefore they show higher activity as I will uh, show you later. Also, we can genetically modify the bacteriophage, especially on the minor code proteins, and therefore self-assemble the whole structure. I will skip the synthesis part now. You can read about this in our publication in SES Nano, um, and we'll focus on the two uh, applications that we achieved with this. Uh, first is the catalysis that we did with the enzyme phage colloids. For this, we just um, dispersed the enzyme phage colloid in a solution containing the substrate of the enzyme, in this case, urease. And then after the reaction was done, we just uh, um, put a magnet on the side of the container and regenerated the enzyme phage colloid for another run. And we did this for a lot of cycles. And you see that the performance characteristics are quite well over those cycles of the enzyme, which is very nice if you, for example, using an expensive enzyme, that might be a nice way to uh, recollect it and reuse it in a very, with a very simple step. Also, we saw that the activity, namely KCAT, is twice as high of the urease on our enzyme phage co uh, colloid compared to free in solution. Uh, the second application is an enzymatic micropump. In those devices, the enzyme is generally gathered on the bottom of a micro container. And we did this with a tiny magnet, which just aggregated the particles to the surface. And then via density difference, a convective flow is starting, which is then pumping tracer particles around. 
We also figured out that instead of using an artificial solution with a urea as fuel and tracer particles, we can also just use blood since there is a natural blood concentra uh, urea concentration in blood which can be used as a fuel. And this, of course, could theoretically be used in a lab on a chip device to maybe uh, pump uh, blood to two different sensors on the bottom and on the top of the device. Now I would like to talk about another application of enzymes and phages, this time, this time without the colloids. You can also directly link the phages in the, here, the sticks together, and then uh, decorate them with the enzymes to form an active nanonet. This can then be used in a pump-through catalytic converter where you just pump your substrate solution through the nanonet and then get out in the end the product solution. In this case, you can also, of course, reuse the enzyme for multiple runs and the performance is quite stable. Now I will talk about the other brand, uh, bigger topic of this talk, which is uh, does an enzyme swim when it is active? First, let's talk about what's going on in an active enzyme. You can see here the crystal structures of uh, hexokinase with and without the a bound substrate. And first thing you will notice is there is a conformational change during the catalytic process. Of course, there's also a mass transport. The substrate is binding to the, to the enzyme and then the product is released afterwards. Also, heat is generated if it's an exothermic reaction. So the question is, does this cause propulsion in the end? There has been a very prominent uh, paper about this in Nature in 2015, where the enzyme alkaline phosphatase was studied. And usually the active diffusion coefficient D is compared to the diffusion coefficient of the passive enzyme. And they saw a nearly twofold increase of the diffusion of the enzyme and present of the substrate. Recently, uh, Yifei Sang and Henry Hess have summarized in a review the results of multiple of those studies of active enzymes. And you can see here the diffusion enhancement over the catalytic activity of the various enzymes tested. And we see that the diffusion enhancement effect is more or less independent of the catalytic rate of the enzymes and also independent of the enthalpy. As we can see, most of those enzymes are exothermic, but they are also endothermic enzymes. We then uh, tried to reproduce those results and figured out that there are some problems with the original publications. That's why we summarized what we think are reasons why FCS, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, results can be uh, misinterpreted as diffusion enhancement. We found those four different uh, potential artifacts, but for today I'd like to focus on fluorescence quenching since this is the most interesting result. We reproduced those um, measurements in the Nature paper that I showed you earlier, where alkaline phosphatase diffusion is measured in the presence of the substrate NPP, but NPP is also a known fluorescent quencher. And we think that this apparent diffusion enhancement, which you can see in the autocollation function as a shift to shorter collation times, is actually caused by quenching. The theoretical explanation goes like this. The enzyme is diffusion, diffusing through the confocal volume and uh, is having collisional quenching with the quencher that's sitting the fluorophore on the enzyme which basically brings the fluorophore into a dark stage, which then shortens the correlation time. We also simulated this kind of behavior in an autocollation function, where you can see only contributions of quenching and no diffusion enhancement is put into this computation. And you can see the resemblance is, is quite big between the simulated autocollation function and the measured one. You can even see this little dip here that's uh, visible in both. To further prove this, we measured the fluorescence lifetime of the fluorophore bound to the enzyme in the presence of the substrate, and you can see there's quenching going on. 
We also measured a non-quenching substrate, which was a no completely new experiment for alkaline phosphatase. And you can see there is no quenching of the fluorophore and there's also no diffusion enhancement. This makes us believe there's no diffusion enhancement at all for alkaline phosphatase, which of course contradicts the earlier mentioned publication. After doing those fluorescence correlation spectroscopy measurements, we wanted to do use another technique for the diffusion measurements of active enzymes. We focused on pulse feed gradient nuclear magnetic resonance, which uses a gradient in the magnetic field over the sample, which labels basically the different molecules with their spin precession frequency. This has several advantages. The main one is that you can do label-free measurements so you don't need this, the earlier mentioned fluorophore anymore. We focus on aldolase and particularly on the aliphatic range in the proton NMR spectrum of aldolase. This turned out to be the first ever diffusion NMR measurement of an active enzyme, which you can see here. This is the attenuation of the aldolase aliphatic signal from which you can uh, then calculate diffusion coefficient. And we found out that there is no diffusion enhancement for aldolase. Also, we tested other cases where the aldolase was in presence, not of the substrate, but of other things like the inhibitor, which has been published earlier, and also tracers in solution. For all those, we didn't find a diffusion enhancement, which contradicts several papers that have been published in the recent years. And we think the explanation could be that there are aggregates in solution while those measurements are performed, which then dissociate in the presence of the substrate. We used the tetramer, which is the native state of aldolase for our experiments, but we saw in our uh, FPLC chromatogram that there are also a lot of aggregates present in the commercially available enzyme. Now I would like to present a little outlook of what we are working on right now. Or the question we are focusing on is what is the smallest active biological swimmer? And as you might know, there are a lot of uh, micro swimmers uh, um, that are based on enzymes. So biological swimmers or biohybrid swimmers of inorganic particles and enzymes um, in the nanometer scale. Until now, there only have been reported synthetic swimmers. And on the angstrom scale, we now know that it's not really clear if those enzymes, for example, can swim at all by themselves. So we focused on the nanoscale and we uh, built a completely biological swimmer, which, contain, uh, which contains uh, DNA origami and enzymes, which you can see here. And we were able to track those particles with single particle tracking and extracted the diffusion coefficient. This work is still ongoing and I hope to present it to you in maybe FNANO 2021. Now it's time to thank all the people that uh, contributed to the work. I especially thank Per Fischer and, uh, for his supervision and uh, many people contributed by helping to prepare the samples and also helped a lot with those very uh, specialized measurement uh, techniques like the multi-detector FCS and the PFG NMR. Also special thanks to the group in Stuttgart and the funding that we received for this work. And last but not least, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us via email and we are happy to talk to you.